opening the door to the building of the third Jewish temple. Some called it a kiss from heaven. Something extraordinary has just occurred, something that many have been waiting for with bated breath for centuries. After years of anticipation and controversy, the third temple has finally been inaugurated marking a historic moment in time that has captured the attention of people worldwide. As a holiest site on Earth, this event holds immense significance for people of various faiths and cultures, raising questions about the future of the world and the power dynamics that underpin it. In this discussion, we'll explore the implications of this momentous milestone and what it could mean for the world as a whole. Despite the efforts of the Muslim community to disprove any continuity between modern Israel and ancient Judea, work continues on the Third Temple's vessels and the training of Levites and Kohanim. The Jewish claim to the Temple Mount is deliberately undermined by the Jerusalem Islamic Authority, the Waq, which destroys or conceals any evidence of the First and Second Holy Temples. The Waq, responsible for managing the site, excavated the ancient and priceless ruins of the Beit Hamikdash and dumped them in a public landfill seemingly unconcerned about the millennia-old artifacts they were destroying. Waqf has coordinated with Israeli authorities to keep Jews and Christians out of the Temple Mount compound ever since the Israeli government turned over control of the site to them in 1967. Jews have been praying, may it be your will that the temple is soon restored in our own time. Every day since the Roman general Titus destroyed the last Jewish temple in AD 70 and the Israeli government has given police permission to enforce this discriminatory ritual. Several groups in recent decades have merged religious fervor with radical political action. In the old city of Jerusalem, not far from the Western Wall, the temple in waiting has been built according to Chaim Richman, director of the Temple Institute. According to Richman's interview with Chris Mitchell of CBN News, the Temple Institute is actively involved in the research and planning of the restoration of service in the Holy Temple, going so far as to offer operational blueprints for the construction of the temple by the most modern standards. In preparation for services to be in the soon-to-be-rebuilt temple, the Institute has already produced over 60 priceless temple vessels. The High Priest's Breastplate, which is decorated with the 12 precious stones that stand for the 12 tribes of Israel, and the Levitical instruments are also prepared. The Institute was also in charge of creating the vestments worn by priests. These garments are reserved for the newly ordained Levitical priests, who are currently undergoing their training. Only Aaron and his descendants were chosen to be Kohanim. Therefore, only Jews who can prove their ancestry to the tribe of Levi through the line of Aaron, Moses' brother, are qualified to be Levitical priests. Cohen is a common Jewish surname, and it may suggest a connection to the house of Aaron. Non-Aaronic Levites were in charge of the temple's upkeep and furnishings, while Kohanim were in charge of sacrifices. It's been almost 95 years since a British magazine reported that Chief Rabbi Kook of Jerusalem had established Torat Kohanim, a yeshiva, to train Levites for work in the rebuilt temple. It was said that students at Kook's school participated in temple sacrifices on par with those of the first and second temples. While the chief rabbi did agree that the recent establishment of a Palestinian mandate to give Jews a homeland in the ancient land of Israel revealed a divine providence that allowed the improbable to become probable in response to a question from a Jerusalem Zionist executive, he emphasized that his institution was primarily a Torah academy. That is to say, the possibility of a rebuilt temple was no longer inconceivable once the Jews were back in their country. Also, one day all nations will recognize the truth of our claims to the temple area, the chief rabbi said, ending his response on a hopeful note. This great holy house will be established there under the care of its original and eternal owners, the people of Israel, G. People D's, since the beginning of time, and the entire world will know and recognize that the prophecy regarding this holy place, that my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, has come true. Only they can do it, Third Temple College. The Temple Institute and the Third Temple Academy have started preparing for the Third Temple in the footsteps of Chief Rabbi Kook, with the expectation that God will soon fulfill his prophecies regarding the Temple. A field school for the Kohanim and Levites of the Third Temple was founded in 2009 close to Mizpe Yeriko. In 2010, uncut stones for the temple altar were dredged from the Dead Sea. It is generally accepted that stones in such pristine condition cannot have been altered by metal. Leviticus 27.5 says that. The Third Temple Academy, located in Mizpe Yeriko, on the way to Jericho and the Jordan Valley, may be reached in a little over half an hour's drive from Jerusalem. The institution has built a replica of the temple so that its priesthood students can perform ritual sacrifices while studying the building's historical and practical significance. Kohanim also get ready for the Tamid service, which is performed every day as part of the normal temple ceremonies in the Holy Temple. The total impact was fascinating as we witnessed a sacred event that had been written in the Torah 4,000 years ago, but had been forgotten after 2,000 years of exile. Details from the old texts and descriptions started to take shape, according to a Facebook post, as modern-day descendants of Aaron 
The first high priest and father of all Kohanim worked relentlessly to carry out their allotted obligations. Four Kohanim walk past a movable altar that can be reconstructed inside the third temple at the Temple Institute. Jars of unadulterated olive oil are being carried by two priests to the third temple's storage area. The slope leading up to the altar is where you'll find the three-pronged fork used to bring offerings to the flames at the top of the altar. The copper vase will be emptied of the ashes from the previous day. Since then, a major change has occurred. This Pesach, Passover 2015, the student Kohanim successfully reenacted the Corbin Pesach in all its historical accuracy. No one has ever made such a sacrifice in the past 2,000 years. In the clip from the Temple Institute's reenactment, the Kohanim wear white and make use of sacred items. Years of research went into creating the uniforms, building the ships, and staging the reenactments. In the picturesque Sumerian hills close to Shiloh, the Kohanim used silver cups called Mizrak to transfer the blood of the Passover lamb from one priest to another. It is intolerable that the Jewish people cannot offer the Korban Pesach on Har Habayas as required by Halakha. A Kohen uses a silver Mizrak to collect the blood from the sacrifice. The blood is taken by the priest and splattered in the altar's nook. We beseech all of Israel to make the Korban Pesach the centerpiece of their Passover setters. The Pesach Korban is a representation of Israel's uncompromising stance against all forms of idolatry. Richmond elaborates, saying, we can only hope to fulfill our divine calling to be a light to the nations and celebrate Yom Tov appropriately in the restored Jerusalem if we have a firm grasp on what the Passover experience is all about. In line with Leviticus 23.10, the Omer was carried to the temple for a trial run on the second day of Pesach this year. The Kohanim of the third temple will eat the majority of the Omer they harvest rather than sacrifice it. Although clearly a lot has to happen for this to happen, Richmond insists, that we have enough in place today to resume divine service and to build the temple. Seven weeks must elapse before the harvest may begin. This period begins when the first sickle is placed on the standing grain, putting together the rite of purification using the red heifer at the third temple. Although the temple's vessels have been made and the priests are in training, there are enormous hurdles that must be addressed before the building of a new temple can commence. The current lack of a ritually pure red heifer prevents the fulfillment of the mandate to use a red heifer to cleanse the altar. To achieve these standards, specimens cannot have any flaws, not even little variances in hair color. There have been previous cases of red heifers being rejected because they had black calves, including one in New Jersey last year. Once a cow has given birth, she can no longer be bred. Instead of waiting for one to show up in a herd somewhere, the Temple Institute has begun implanting frozen red Angus embryos into Israeli domestic cattle to create red heifers. For that reason, a crowd financing campaign is currently in progress. Nearly $31,000 has been collected so far. Jerusalem, I have posted guards at your gates. They will continuously raise the alarm. Do not relax, O worshippers of the Lord, until he rebuilds his holy city of Jerusalem and makes her the pride of the peoples. Since only blocks prepared at the quarry were used in the temple's construction, no iron tools were ever heard at the site. The cornerstones for the new temple were prepared with diamond rather than steel cutting tools to comply with the scriptural mandate that no metal instrument be used in the construction of the temple, an architecture of peace. This organization is known as the Temple Mount Faithful and it is led by Gershon Solomon. The six-ton stones were blessed with water taken from the biblical pool of Siloam. For years, Solomon and his followers have tried to place these cornerstones on the Temple Mount, but Israeli security forces have stopped them each time. When asked to elaborate, Solomon said, sadly, the weakness of the Israeli leadership did not allow us to move the cornerstones to the correct position. He was making a point on the necessity of reconstructing the temple on the Temple Mount. There will be a third temple built in the same place as the first two. One of Muhammad's dreams, as recounted in the Hadith, involved a journey to the farthest mosque for a conference with the biblical prophets. It is generally accepted that this refers to the city of Jerusalem and its Temple Mount. Here, in the second heaven, John the Baptist, he conferred with the Archangel Gabriel, Jesus Christ, and Yahweh. After encountering Joseph in the third heaven, the story continues with his encounters with Aaron, Moses, Abraham, and God. The Temple Mount is currently occupied by two religious buildings, the Mosque of Omar and the Dome of the Rock, coated in gold because it is believed to house the rock from which Muhammad is reported to have risen to heaven. Due to Muslim claims of ownership over the Temple Mount, Jews have little expectation of really being able to build the third temple there. Among Islam's most sacred sites, the Al-Aqsa Mosque atop the Temple Mount ranks third in importance. Book of Daniel Prophecies Future Temple As the prophets Daniel and Ezekiel and the Apostle Paul all state unequivocally that another temple will be erected. The preparation of a modern priesthood is an act of anticipation and faith. For one week, he will make a firm commitment with the people. But in the middle of that week, 
he will put an end to sacrifice and grain offering. Muslims insist on the land being their property and oppose any plans to build a Jewish temple there. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul gives us a clue. Let no one fool you in any way, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will defy and endeavor to elevate himself above everything held in awe or considered divine eventually staking claim to a throne in God's hallowed temple. From the time of peace into the three and a half years of Jacob's suffering, also known as the Great Tribulation, billions of people will follow the one destined for tragedy, who is often termed the anti-Messiah. We can't stop this person from coming to the new temple to be venerated as God. We can't know the exact time of his return, but we can prepare to recognize the indicators of his coming and fortify our faith so that we can withstand the widespread persecution that will be the norm at that time, persecution that may lead to death. Millions of Christians, who had hoped a rapture would save them from the tribulation, are now experiencing its worst effects witnessing the slaughter and destruction at the hands of Muslim radicals. When asked about the end times in 1975, Ruth Graham, wife of evangelist Billy Graham, remarked, I would rather prepare myself to go through the tribulation and be delightfully surprised by an unexpected rapture than expect to be raptured only to find myself going through the tribulation. This may not be the most scholarly analysis of the problem, but it does have some merit. With the help of Yeshua Hamashiach, and the Holy Spirit, we can be prepared to deal with adversity and identify false messiahs. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we will live in peace, hope, joy, and righteousness, and emerge victorious from adversity until the glorious day of the Lord. Here I am, Lord Jesus, send me not a stranger. Revelation 22, 20. That's it for today's video. We will be right back with more, so don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.